we're continuing this week to look at some of the events in the lives of people who um, who knew Jesus when he was walking around on earth or people who just encountered him, uh, even just for a brief moment. And uh, the effect that he had on them and the things that we can learn from their experiences. This week, we're looking at a story that is recorded in the book of John, chapter 8, verses 3 to 11. The story may be familiar to you. It's commonly known as the story of the woman caught in adultery. There are a lot of uh, sort of misconceptions around this story. Things that come out of our own imaginations and our own artistic license, even. Things like the, the paintings and the films and the photographs that we've seen that portray the woman down on the ground, down on her hands and knees with her hair, shielding her face, and just completely humiliated and at the mercy of the people who are standing around her. When in fact, it wouldn't have looked like that at all. The language in the text indicates that, that she was standing standing tall and standing straight in the middle of her accusers. Another image that comes to mind sometimes, you may have heard this in songs, that the Pharisees were holding the stones in their hands, ready to throw them at a moment's notice the second the verdict was pronounced. And in fact, that would not have been the case. This story took place in the temple court. The temple court was a holy and special place. And if she had indeed been condemned to death, she would have been not only removed from the temple, but removed beyond the city walls, outside into the wilderness, to receive her punishment. So they wouldn't have been standing there with stones in their hands. Some of the questions that people ask about this story are, you know, we start with the obvious one. How is it possible to catch one person in the act of adultery? Like, how does that even work? Another question that uh, comes to my mind is, I wonder if when the woman was brought to Jesus and he heard the charge leveled against her, if maybe he had a momentary flash on when his own mother was at risk of facing the same charge and the same punishment. But I think the most important question that we can ask about this event, about this story, is what happened next? What happens after the story ends? What happened to this woman? I like to think that the women who we know were following Jesus, who were among his followers at the time, would have come around her and embraced her and, and welcomed her into friendship. I like to think that maybe her husband would have forgiven her and taken her back and that she would have begun to rebuild her life as a follower of Jesus. But we don't know. We don't know what happened. The one thing that we can take away from this story that I think is the most powerful is the way Jesus gives people opportunities he gives them new chances. He hands them their responsibility for their lives and says, what are you going to do with me? Whether it's the, the bystanders and the witnesses who had gathered around Jesus in the temple just to hear what he had to say. Some were probably followers and, and were coming to believe that he really was someone remarkable. And others would have been uh, just curious, just wondering what the crowd was and, and who this guy was that everybody was listening to. But in this moment, when Jesus is confronted with a split-second decision, a split-second life and death decision, they had the chance to see how he lived out all of the things that he had been teaching. John quotes Jesus earlier in the book as saying things like, don't judge just by appearances, but judge according to what is right. He says, if you are thirsty, come to me. 
and I will give you living water. He says, whoever comes to me, I will never cast them out. He says, God did not send me to condemn, but he sent me to save. And here in this moment, they see Jesus living that. They see him not condemning, but saving. Another person who had an opportunity, obviously, was the woman herself. Jesus didn't condemn her, but he gave her the opportunity to take responsibility for her future. He set her free to begin again and to begin what would have been very hard work to repair everything that she had broken, to accept the responsibility for the damage that she had done, to see herself and the promises that she had broken in a new light and to ask herself, where do I go from here? And Jesus even gave the accusers an opportunity. He gave them a chance to examine their own hearts. He gave them that time to think, to stop and think about their own motivation, their own guiltiness, their own imperfection. And the fact that they themselves had things that they needed to repair, that they had broken. We're going to take a few moments this morning to, uh, to do a Lectio Divina, the way we've been doing them on Sunday mornings. We, uh, we follow a pattern of read, reflect, respond, and receive. We read together the scriptures that will be on the screen in this case, it's a selection of scriptures on a particular theme from different places in the New Testament. We'll read those together. Then we will reflect. Um, I will read sections of each passage and pause for a moment to give us all time to, to see how, how we, we see our own reflection in these passages. Do I see myself as an accuser? Do I see myself as the accused? Do I see myself as a bystander? How do these verses matter to me in my relationship with Jesus? Then we'll take a moment to sit in silence and respond and hear what God has to say to each of us in response to the verses that we've been looking at. And then we will close a prayer with a prayer of receiving and saying yes to God for the things that he has been saying to us in the last few moments. So we begin. I hope you'll read out loud with me the verses that will be on the screen. Join me in reading. For God so loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only son that Everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away, and look, new things have come. Therefore, repent and turn back so that your sins may be wiped out and that seasons of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. Now we reflect. Who do you see yourself as? How do these verses reflect? who you are as you listen. For God loved the world. Times of refreshing come from the presence of the Lord.
if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. New things have come. Old things have passed away. Confess your sins to one another. Pray for one another. You may be healed. And seasons of refreshing come from the presence of the Lord. Everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Seasons of refreshing come from the presence of the Lord. He is faithful and righteous to forgive us. Repent and turn back. Confess your sins so that you may be healed. Now let's take a moment to sit in silence and let those things sink into our hearts. It may not be silent at your house. The neighbor's dog might be barking and the fridge might be coming on and off, but that's okay if we silence our hearts and our minds. Let's hear from the Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, please give us the courage to say yes to you. To say yes to your call for confession and repentance. To say yes to the seasons of refreshing that come from you. To say yes to the healing of spirit and mind that come from you. To say yes to the eternal life that comes from you and to say yes to Jesus. We thank you for the opportunities that you give us to take a hard look at ourselves, to see not only the things we've got wrong, but the ways in which you've forgiven us and the new paths that you have opened up for us down the road. We thank you that we have each other that we can turn to, people who will accept us with love and patience and forgiveness when we go wrong over and over. And we turn back over and over because only you have the words of life. Where else can we go?
engrave these ideas and these words deep in our hearts so that we can remember that yes, we get things wrong and yes, we have to face consequences, but yes, you forgive us and give us the strength to begin again. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Welcome to First Baptist Church, Port Hope. Can I pray with you before we begin? Lord, thank you so much for everyone who's watching this, whether they are part of the First Baptist Church family physically in Port Hope and Coburg, or whether they're just watching this and have come across this accidentally on YouTube. I pray, Lord, that you would give us ears to hear what you want to say to us, and that uh, we would in some way be challenged and changed by the power of your word. Lord, please give me the strength to share what it is you've wanted me to share. And just take this time, it's yours, Lord. Do whatever you'd like with it. In Jesus' name, amen. So this is being recorded on January 22nd for play on January 24th, a Sunday. It's January, the beginning of a new year. So I thought we'd look at new challenges and, <clears throat> or even resolutions that we can make for the beginning of 2021. I was talking with a friend this week about New Year's resolutions and I said, well, about 25, 30 years ago, I made a New Year's resolution never to make New Year's resolutions again. And I kept that one. 
But January 1st is often a time, a nice time when the calendar rolls over, when we think, okay, what can we start, what can we do differently in our lives? And we've been looking over the last few weeks at some very, very basic things in the Christian life and challenging us. What can we do in 2021 to, to make these um, disciplines, these aspects of Christian life part of our day-to-day -day life? So the first thing we looked at was evangelism. Asking the Lord to put one or two or three people on our heart and mind that we could begin to pray about and look for opportunities to connect with them and to share the message of the gospel through, um, through common ground that we may have with that person. Last week we looked at reading the Bible and just how everyone knows how important that is, but so many of us neglect it. And just the challenge there to figure out a reading plan for 2021, whether it's to look through specific books or read the Bible from cover to cover or, or pick, you know, not, and more than just, you know, reading a devotional where you read a scripture verse and then you read what someone else has to say about it. And that's really, really good. But I mean, just simply reading the Bible and seeing what it says to us. So that's, that was the challenge. And the third challenge we want to look at today is, again, a very basic part of the Christian life, and that is prayer. Such an essential part of the Christian walk, and yet it's something that can be so easily squeezed out of our lives. It can be squeezed out by time. We just have a hard time to find the time to, to make prayer part of our lives. It gets squeezed out by distractions. We get busy doing things, or even when we start to pray, our mind just goes off in different directions. I was just watching an episode of Everybody Loves Raymond this morning, and uh, the wife, Deborah, was taking all the kids to church, to mass, and Raymond didn't want to go, and, or didn't go, and Deborah's saying, why don't you ever want to go to, to church? And Raymond's like, well, I get there, and I'm distracted. I'm supposed to be thinking about God, but I'm thinking about, hey, what's that person wearing over there? Hey, that person's hair needs to be combed, and then, getting distracted. Now, I mean, it's up to us to control the distractions in our lives, but, but prayer can sometimes, prayer requires a lot of focus at times, and it, we can be easily distracted, and it can draw us away from prayer times. Sin can distract us from prayer. The last thing you want to do when you know when you, when you were a kid, and you know you did something wrong, and you feel really guilty about it, the last thing you wanted to do was talk to mom or dad about anything because you knew that they would start to see through you and that you took those cookies out of the cookie jar and eventually the guilt would hit and you'd have to tell them. And maybe that's too simple an analogy, but you know, when we know that our lives aren't right with God, when we know that we've done things that have hurt him, hurt others, hurt ourselves, um, Sometimes the last thing we want to do is talk to God because we know that at some point in that conversation, we're going to have to come face to face with what we've done. So that sometimes keeps us from prayer. Sometimes we, you know, we don't get an answer to prayer right away and we think, well, does prayer really make a difference? But despite all these things, prayer is so vital, so important. It's like oxygen. It's, it's, our, it's our breath. It's the breath of our spirit. It provides life to us. And so we want to look at seven aspects of prayer, seven things that need to be a part of our lives and part of our prayer lives. I'm going to do something that I rarely ever do. A lot of preachers do this, but we're going to use alliteration. Yay! All seven things will begin with the letter A. Okay? Ready for this? Number one, pray always. Pray always. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says to pray without ceasing in the King James Version or to pray continually in the NIV. There's that place for prayer where it's focused and our eyes are closed and our knees are bowed and we take a posture of prayer where that's what we focus on. <clears throat> but it's so important to realize that God is with us always. He is with you through every part of your day and he cares about every part of your day. He says in scripture that he will never leave you and he will never forsake you. And we can get engaged in communication with God our Father wherever we are and whatever we're doing. Our life can be one continual dialogue 
with God the Father. We can talk to him and sense his presence when we're doing the dishes, when we're at school, in algebra class, when we are at work taking care of that problem in accounting, when we're at, on the computer working out of, at, out, out of our office at home. We can engage in conversation always, all the time. Throughout the day, we can engage in praise, we can engage in worship, we can engage in, in petition and in asking God for help, we can engage in intercession and in praying for other people. And so we, we, our challenge in praying always is to develop this, this constant awareness of God's continual presence. There's an old chorus that we used to sing in church that he's as close as the mention of his name. And just breathing the name of Jesus is a prayer that, that invites his spirit into whatever situation in your life you're facing at that very moment. So pray always. Develop a habit of praying continually throughout your life, knowing that, that that access to God the Father is always there. Number two, pray alone. Pray alone. As important it's just the converse now. As important as praying continually is, it's also important to take those special times with eyes closed and knees bowed and, and just focusing on God in prayer, to pray alone. Setting aside specific time in your day, whether it's the same time every day or, or whenever, but a specific time in that day when, when it's just you and God, just the two of you, and that he has your complete attention and your complete focus. Jesus was an example of this, and, and he was fully God, and yet he found it necessary to go off alone and pray. Mark 1.35, Luke 5.16 are two verses that talk about how Jesus would withdraw to lonely places and pray. Sometimes it was early in the morning. Sometimes it says it was all through the night. Often, maybe not every time, but I say the majority of the times when Jesus is specifically said to have gone off alone to pray, something very significant happened the following day, like he was going to choose disciples or some very significant miracle happened the next day. He felt the need in his spirit to get away with God, just, the, just him and God, and prepare for what was coming up next. And so I think we're called to, to follow that example to take the time just to withdraw from people around us, withdraw from the busyness around us, our busy schedule, and just to pray. And to look to God in those special times of prayer before we're going to make, be making those big decisions, before you know big events and situations are coming up in our lives. I mean, sometimes they take us by surprise, but if we know they're gonna happen, take that time specifically to just to get away and set aside time for God. And maybe, so maybe that's one of your challenges for this year is, is to consistently and intentionally set aside that time in your day when you're just going to focus on praying. We see an example of Jesus where he prayed alone, or the instruction he gave was to pray alone and in secret, Matthew 6, 6, where he says, don't be like the Pharisees who make a big ostentatious show of their praying, you know, where everybody can hear them. Look, I'm praying. No, he says, go into your closet and, and go where no one can see you and be there. The, the power that comes into the things that people see in you, in your Christian life, the foundation of that power is in what goes on in the unseen, in the closet. Now, the other thing I think from this passage is that your prayers don't have to be fancy. Like he's not just talking about the public show that the Pharisees make, but also the fact that they would use this flowery, flowery language, you know, to, to try to impress God or impress others. <coughs> Our prayers don't have to be fancy. Our prayers need to just come from the heart, and we're going to look at that in a, in a little bit. But um, just be who you are, simple, and, and just share your prayers before the Lord. That solitary workout, when an athlete is going to play a sport or play a game, they don't just jump in onto the ice and start skating. They will work out, sometimes with the team in a practice, but, but often alone 
Guy Lafleur, who was probably the most famous hockey player of when I was a kid for the Montreal for the Montreal Canadiens. He was known to just love being on the ice by himself. When he was growing up in Thurso, Quebec, he uh, discovered a, a loose panel in the wall of the indoor arena there, and he would sneak in when, early in the morning when no one else was there and get out on the ice and just shoot, practice shots and practice stick handling. Eventually, the custodian of the, of the arena found out he was doing it and just basically left the door open for him so he can go in there and practice. Even when he was a professional, he was always the first one on the ice and sometimes would stay afterwards, after everyone else had gone, just to be alone and to shoot and to shoot and to practice. And so when he got into the game, muscle memory took over and he became one of the top players of his generation. But it was, it was rooted in the stuff that he did alone, working on his skills. And our success, for lack of a better word, in the Christian life will be rooted in what we do alone. The time that we spend with God alone, building up that relationship, building up that confidence in what God is doing in our lives so that when we go out, muscle memory kicks in and we just automatically do what it is that God is working in our lives in those times alone. Solitary time in prayer lays the foundation for us to run the Christian race. What's unseen produces fruit in what is seen. So pray always, pray alone. And number three, pray for all things. Okay, so for the next four points, I'm cheated, all right? I'm using the word all, so shoot me, okay? But to keep the alliteration, but it works, it fits, it fits, okay? So we're going to pray for all things. Philippians 4, 6 says, In everything, present your requests to God. In everything. God is concerned and he cares about every aspect of your life. Sometimes people will say, oh, God, God doesn't care about that. God, he's not interested in that. That's just a little insignificant thing. I'm a little insignificant thing. He's not even interested. But that's not true. In everything, God cares about every aspect of our lives and he wants to hear it. A number of years ago, we used to run a, a youth drop-in center here in Port Hope in the basement of this church. And a lot of kids came who were not believers, not Christians yet, but were, they would come and they would sit and listen, they were interested. And, and I would uh, have a prayer time and ask them for prayer requests, one of the things you want to pray about. And some of the kids, and this was kind of interesting, they honestly felt bad. They said, oh, I don't want to, you know, it's not fair to ask God for help. I don't want to keep you know, bugging him for help for things because it's not that important a thing. Uh, you know, it's not, it's not fair for me to ask God for help when I don't, like, live for him all the rest of the, the, the time. And on the one hand, I appreciated their honesty and I appreciated um, their wanting to not be hypocritical. But on the other hand, I said to them, you know, it, it says right here, ask God about everything, petitions and prayers in everything, lay your requests before God. And so he wants to hear it. Now, he doesn't want us to treat him like a genie in a bottle, you know, just constantly asking for things. That's not right either. But at the same time, he doesn't want us to hold back and just keep it to ourselves and let it just uh, eat away at us on the inside. In everything, pray about all things. Ephesians 6, 18 says, pray in the spirit in all. All, on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. All kinds. There's as many different ways to pray as there are people. And so with all kinds of prayers, all kinds of requests, pray on all occasions. Make laying our lives and, and the situations of our lives before God a habit, a part of who we are. And it says pray in the Spirit. It's the idea of letting God guide you so that what, as to what to pray about. Like it's easy to, on our hearts to say to, our needs are kind of right before us and we know what to pray about. But if we let God's Spirit guide us in the things we pray about, in all the things we pray about, we may find ourselves praying about things that we have ne had never even thought of before. And we may find out ourselves praying about things and situations that really need our prayer. And if we pray in the Spirit, we could be confident that we are praying in God's will. And even be confident that God will answer the prayer because we are praying in the Lord's will. So allow God to, to pray through you by the Holy Spirit 
so that he will guide you into areas of prayers that you may not have even thought of before. So pray for all things. Number four, pray for all people. Ephesians 6, 18, the rest of Ephesians 6, 18 says, always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. We are told first and foremost to pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Pray for those who are part of our church family. Pray for those who are part of all the church family. Pray for those Christians in countries where they aren't allowed to practice their faith in public, where they are persecuted. Pray for all of the Lord's people. Then in 1 Timothy 2, 1 and 2, it says, um, I urge this first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people. So here Timothy is, is broadening the scope. We're not just praying for Christians, but we're praying for everybody, those who believe, those who don't believe. We are called to pray for all people. Pray for the, the needs of everyone. Then he goes on to say, pray for kings and those in authority. In this polarized political climate of ours, it's so easy to be critical. It's so easy to take a, a negative, dim view of, of political leaders. You know, they do one thing and immediately you think negatively of them. But especially in this pandemic, it's a very, very difficult job. And for those who take, and most of them take their roles very seriously, and it's not an easy job. We're told to pray for kings and for those in authority. So the question is, did you pray for Trump? Do you pray for Trudeau or Ford or Biden? It's valid to criticize. It's valid to, to say, okay, I don't agree with what they're, what they're doing, or I think this is a really good thing. That's valid. It's part of our freedoms. We live in a country where we can express our, our opinions about things. Uh, I was reading a couple of weeks ago that in China, communist China, where the virus began, where this pandemic came out from, they, you know, and the Chinese communist government was trying to cover up a lot of it at the very beginning, but there were whistleblowers, there were people, doctors and, and people in the media who were trying to get the word out. And there was this one particular reporter who was trying to get the word out. And she just went on trial for doing that and was sentenced to five years in prison because in China they don't have the freedom to make political statements and to, to, to make criticisms. It's part of our freedom. We, we, we are able to do that. No leader should get a free pass um, on what they're doing. They should always be, they should always be called to account. But before we do that, the first question as Christians we need to ask ourselves is, did I pray for them? Did I pray for them? And oftentimes when we make them a matter of prayer, some of that critique and some of that criticism will start to be tempered, start to go by the boards, and we realize, you know what, I, in this particular situation, I may need to criticize, but in this particular situation, I just need to pray. And then Matthew 5.44 expands the boundary of who we should pray for as well when it says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So not just our Christians, not just our friends, not just non-believing friends and our leaders, but, but our enemies, people who intentionally try to hurt us, we are called to pray for them. Pray for those people who are making your life miserable. <laughs> now that's not easy. That's a big one. That's something where most Christians are like, yeah, God, no, I don't think so. But you know what, when God calls us to do that, and when we, we surrender and do that, it is amazing the change that will happen in us. And it's amazing sometimes the change that will even happen in the other person. It is impossible to hate someone you're praying for. So if you're finding yourself, somebody in your life that's making your life so miserable that you're actually starting to find yourself hating them, start to pray for them. <laughs> Even if you don't feel like it, because I'm sure you won't, but begin to pray for them. And let God change your heart and let your prayers release the Holy Spirit to go and begin to change that person's heart as well. Pray for all things, pray for all people. 
Number five, pray with all your heart. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, God says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. When you're passionate about something, you put your, your heart and your soul into it. And that's what prayer is meant to be. Prayer is not meant to be drab or formal, just words that we pronounce all the time. Unfortunately, the Lord's Prayer has become like reciting the alphabet, and we don't stop to think about what we're saying. Prayer is not to, meant to be formal. It's meant to be a cry from deep in your heart. Prayer is meant to be what's going on inside of you and sharing that with God and connecting with the creator of the universe. We are called to pray with all we've got to pour our heart and soul into it. Sometimes prayer does seem to be kind of empty. Sometimes we feel like God isn't listening or our, our prayers are bouncing off the ceiling. There are a few different reasons why that might be, but sometimes it's because we haven't put our heart into it. Sometimes it's because we're not seeking God with all of our hearts. Sometimes it's because we sit down and we toss a couple of prayers out for a minute or two, which on some days might be good enough, but on this particular day, God is saying, no, you've got to pour your heart into it because I want to do something in your heart and in your situation that is very powerful. And so I need you to seek me with all of your heart. So give God in prayer your everything. And the promise is that you will find him you will find him. Number six, still using all here, pray all together. Pray all together. So as vital as it is, again, to pray alone, it is also vitally important to pray together with other Christians. In Matthew 18, 20, it says, where two or three are gathered together, Jesus says, there am I with them. God's presence is with us, the promise is, when we gather together to pray together. And prayer together was one of the four key elements of the early church. Acts 2.42 is in one verse kind of encapsulates what the early church was all about and what the church of today is supposed to be all about, where they, 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 had, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to breaking of bread, and to prayer. It's important to be able to come together, to share needs together. Galatians 6.2 says, carry each other's burdens, and in this way you fulfill the law of Christ. We come together to pray together, to share our needs. We come to pray together for the church community, for the church at large. We come to, um, to be led into areas of prayer that we may not necessarily think of for ourselves. Other people may have a focus on prayer, and, and you're like, I never thought of things like that before. Let me join you in prayer for that. And it opens up new horizons in our prayer life. And a vital part of growing in community, in feeling closer to your brother and sister in Christ, in discerning what it is that God has in store for your, your body of believers, for your church, is to pray together. And here at First Baptist, we've taken advantage of the pandemic and the technology to begin a Zoom prayer meeting that we're having every Wednesday at 7.30. And we welcome anybody, primarily from the First Baptist Church family, but to be a part of that, where we can pray together, not just for each other's needs, but to pray for our church and to pray for our community and to pray for God's leading and direction and to, to listen to where it is that God might be directing us and leading us as a church as we move forward, hopefully towards the end of this pandemic and then coming out of it, where, what it is that God has in store for us. And a big part of figuring that out is praying together, praying all together, letter A. And the last one is pray for the anointing. Pray for the anointing. When God's people come together in one accord, in unity, and they seek God in prayer together, the biblical pattern is that God responds with the power of his Holy Spirit and does powerful things among them. 
Acts, the first couple of chapters of Acts, we see an example of that. In Acts 1.14 tells us that the disciples found themselves in prayer together in an upper room. And then Acts chapter 2, we read, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. I think the implication from chapter 1 verse 14 is that they were together praying. And suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. They were all together in one place. And the Holy Spirit came and did something that transformed and changed their lives. The work that the Spirit was doing in them was evident to all around. Everybody said, what is with these people? I can hear them speaking in my, my mother tongue. People had come to Jerusalem from all over, all, and spoke many different languages, and they could hear these, their own mother tongue being spoken by these Jewish people. And, and just the, the, it was evident that something special and something different was happening. And Peter, immediately after this, gets up and preaches the very first sermon in the church's history. Now you have to realize that just, what, uh, a month and a half earlier, Jesus, Peter, who said he would never, ever leave Jesus and stand up for him no matter what, Denied, Jesus, denied that he even knew Jesus three times over the course of a few hours because people had accused him of being that Galilean who followed Jesus. Even a little girl accused him and Peter got so upset he swore at her and, and said, I don't know the guy. He had totally turned chicken. And then the Holy Spirit came and he stood up and preached a powerful sermon explaining all that was going on, explaining all about Jesus. And thousands of people were saved and the church was essentially born. Because Peter's life was transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit, which came about because the disciples made the effort to pray together and to pray for that anointing of God's Holy Spirit. In Acts 4.31, it says, after they prayed, disciples the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly in prayer there'll come a time um, when things get shaken when we get serious about prayer it could shake our world we could come to understand things about ourselves and about God that maybe we never saw before and we will be challenged to change. We'll be challenged to become more like Christ. We may in prayer hear and discern things that we are supposed to do and step out and do that may petrify us, but it shakes our world and we are called to be different. We see more about ourselves, we see more about God, we see more about what he calls us to do. And then in prayer, we develop a boldness or a strength to live our Christian lives. It says they spoke the word of God boldly as a result of praying, praying together, and praying for God's spirit to move, which his spirit did. And it became like oxygen. Um, this afternoon, there'll be two football games on Sunday afternoon. Um, the, the, the conference finals for the NFL, the two winning teams will go on to the Super Bowl. And you'll see sometimes in a football game, usually in hotter weather, uh, a player will come off the field after playing, you know, 10 or 12 downs in a row and he's huffing and puffing. And he'll go over to the bench and he will grab a thing that will go over his mouth and he will just breathe pure oxygen. And it just revitalizes him. It, it just fills his lungs with, with the oxygen that he needs and gives him the strength to get out there and get back into the fray, into the next scrimmage together with his team. And we are called to be like that sometimes, to come away, to, to, to engage in that oxygen of prayer, 
where it fills our spirits with the new life that we need, with the strength that we need to get out there and go back and get involved in this world, get involved in this culture that God calls us to be salt and light to. So God has given us the gift of prayer. Can you imagine? We get to talk to the creator of the universe. He has made that self himself available to us. And when we neglect that, we miss so much. Joseph Scriven was from Port Hope, and he wrote the hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. And one of the lines, if I can remember it correctly, said, Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. God is calling us to, to let me go through these, to pray always, to pray alone, to pray for all things, to pray for all people, to pray with all of our heart, to pray all together, and to pray for the anointing. And when we do that, the changes and the difference that will be in our lives will be, well, to keep with the theme, it'll be just amazing. Lord, thank you for giving us the gift of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for the, the access that we have to the throne room, of, throne room of God, that we can come before you and ask for forgiveness for the things we've done that have missed the mark of what you've created us for, that we can ask for forgiveness for the things we've done that have hurt others, hurt ourselves, and hurt you, the things we failed to do. Thank you, Lord, that we can come to you in prayer on our own just to seek strength, to seek solace, to seek comfort, to let you heal the wounds that we feel on the inside and to hear your voice. Thank you, Lord, you give us the prayer that we can gain strength and breathe in your spirit and breathe in new life to get the strength we need to move on to do what you've called us to do. Thank you, Lord, that we have continual prayer, that no matter what we're doing throughout the day, that we can talk to you and that you are interested and that you care. Thank you, Lord, that you care about every aspect of our lives. Help us, Lord, to pray about all things. Help us, Lord, to pray for all people, even and especially those people in our lives that make our life miserable and that are so hard to love. Help us to gain that power to love them through prayer. Help us, Lord, to put all of our heart into prayers, to, to lay ourselves bare before you and not think we have to use fancy words. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us to, to pray for the anointing, to pray that your Holy Spirit would, would make the drastic changes in our lives that we see in the lives of the apostles, that we would speak the word of God boldly, that we would live for you boldly, that you would give us the, the, the power and the ability to be able to, to live out what you've called us to be. So, Lord, I pray that you would help us in the days to come to lay out a plan, a prayer for our lives, whether that's to make the time every day or to, to be more aware of continually praying, to pray for other people more often. Lord, help us to make the, set the goals that you want us to set so that we can take the next step forward in our life of prayer with you. Thank you, Lord, for giving us um, this opportunity to talk to you. Thank you for hearing us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So for the next week that's left in January, think about those one, two, three people that you want God to lay in your heart that you could share the gospel with and share God's love with. Think about how you're going to incorporate Bible reading more into your life and make it a part of your life. And think about the next step you want to take in your prayer life, whatever that's going to look like, whether it's getting up earlier in the morning to pray later at night, setting aside specific time, praying for people specifically, praying for the anointing of the Holy Spirit, or just being more conscious of being able to pray throughout the day. Whatever that, whatever that change, whatever, whatever that next step is for you, make that commitment this week to do that in this year to come. God bless you.